In the early 1960s, President Kennedy, in speeches, referred to this country as Laos. I want to make a brief statement about Laos. Our special concern with the problem in Laos goes back to 1954. But the people here call themselves Lao, and their country, Laos. I'm Rachel Parsons, and I travel alone all over the world show you that traveling solo doesn't have to be so scary. And being alone doesn't mean you're lonely. So come on, don't wait for anyone to go with. The world is not going to wait for you. Don't be afraid. Coagulated pig's blood. Don't be afraid. Be a peregrine dame. To be fair to Kennedy, he started pronouncing Laos correctly not long after that press conference. And to be sure, even I still get confused about when or if to pronounce the S. But truthfully, I hadn't thought about any aspect of Laos until recently. Until about six months ago, I really hadn't given Laos much thought. And then I started telling people I wanted to come to Southeast Asia. And to a person, every one of them said, oh, you have to go to Laos. So I've decided to come to Laos, alone, like usual. And I'm starting in Luang Prabang, a UNESCO World Heritage Site for its collection of 33 Buddhist temples. as well as its beautifully preserved French colonial town center. It's no surprise I've landed in Luang Prabang. Frankly, it's one of the reasons Laos landed on the American travel radar to begin with. And it's an easy starting point. There are a multitude of chic boutique hotels in the tiny historic center, sandwiched between the Mekong and Namkon rivers. But I'm on a tighter budget, so I've chosen one of the ubiquitous guest houses within walking distance. The Ati guest house is perfect for me. Clean and bright, and about $11 a night. Until 1975, when the Pathet Lao, the Communist Party here, took over the country, Laos was a kingdom. The colonial architecture you see is the result of the French steaming through the region in the late 1800s. France claimed the kingdom of Luang Prabang and incorporated it into its Indochina protectorate, but allowed royalty to keep governing. International agreements booted out the French for good in the 50s, but by that time the Pathet Lao already had an eye on the monarchy. When the party gained control, they forcibly evicted the king and his family from his palace, which is now a museum. I've opted instead to get oriented geographically, and in dry clothes, for a split second anyway. Apart from the Mekong, Luang Prabang's defining feature is Mount Phu Si, and at the top of Mount Phu Si is Wat Chom Si, at night, it looks like it's floating in midair. During the day, it's a hot trek. It's more than 300 feet in the air and more than 300 steps. So be prepared. It's not quite as bad as you think it's going to be when you start, but you also need to be fairly fit to do it, and there is no other way up. You also need to pay a small fee, around 20,000 keep, or about two and a half dollars to reach the top. And it goes to the temple. If you're here in the late afternoon, you're going to be here with a crowd, whether you like it or not, because it's a very popular spot to view the sunset. However, people are no, it's, it's really worth the climb because the views are spectacular. It's a good way to get oriented to the town and to sit and quietly observe the monks performing daily rituals. Scholars believe Buddhism reached this part of Asia as far back as the first century CE and watching the gorgeous light soften into twilight over the Mekong more than makes up for the crowd and the sweat. Besides, once the sun goes down, it's easy enough to cool off back on ground level. As evening falls, the night markets open up, the whole town becomes one softly lit, very romantic spot where people just stroll the streets, serenaded by the music of motorbikes. 
Softly lit might be a bit of an understatement. The truth is the historic core of the town center becomes a lantern festooned fairyland. Bring a date or find one. You know I didn't bring one and I also didn't find one, so I'm calling it a night. Here's a not so secret fact about me. I'm a coffee snob. I came around to Saffron because, quite frankly, the Wi-Fi in my guest house is pretty wonky, and I had heard two things from the guidebook about this place. One, that the coffee was excellent, and in the land of Nescafe, that's very important to me. And two, that the Wi-Fi was good and strong, and I had to take care of some business. So I've come for the coffee and the internet, but I just read the company's story. And I think I really want to meet the guy who started this. My name is David Dale, and I began Saffron Coffee in 2006. And I actually started out not thinking about coffee. My vision for Saffron Coffee started really when I was working for a different company that promoted soybeans. I didn't think, oh, I want to do coffee, where can I do this? Um, I really thought about Wampabang as a city, not just a city, but the whole province around the city. Which is mountainous. David noticed how much harder mountain farmers had to work for less yield in corn and rice than their southern counterparts on flat land. They only get, you know, maybe a few million keep per hectare off of corn or job's tears or, or rice, if they have enough. And so with coffee, they can get, you know, they can get more than, you know, four up to five times as much. And coffee meant all of his other criteria. I wanted to promote some kind of cash crop that we could plant up in the hillsides to help put it in to slash and burn um, agriculture, something that would be a perennial crop. And maybe most importantly, we want to have a positive effect. If we we're only about the financial bottom line, we would probably try to get a big plantation and have our own coffee trees that we could control and then hire people to come work in it. But as you know, a point of my you know, philosophy of how we're operating this business as a social enterprise, I didn't want to do that. I want Lao farmers to not just be hired hands, but to own their own coffee. And in the end, if our company fades away, they'll still be the owners of their coffee and could seek other markets for it. And so it puts them in charge of their own coffee. David's particularly driven to help his community in no small part because his wife is Lao. Actually, it's she who owns Saffron. The empowerment now extends to roughly 800 families who grow shade-grown certified organic coffee for the company. The process starts when Saffron gives farmers the sprouts for their coffee trees. This one's going to Mr. C, and he's got 800 in here. And so he'll get this today and plant it in his bags this afternoon, this evening. I've caught David just after a harvest, so processing is beginning on the newest batch of coffee cherries. The thing that farmers harvest from their trees. Because you should taste it here. You want me to? Does it? Yeah. Does it's it taste sweet. anything like it's no, sweet? No, no, no. It doesn't taste anything, it doesn't like, taste anything like coffee. Like coffee. So, so just kind of squeeze that. It'll, there'll be two seeds that pop out into your mouth. Okay. Should I eat the seeds us? or to the? We oh, can chew sure. them. I can chew the seeds. Yeah. Tell okay. me if I'm holding it the right way. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. How long am I now? All right. Ooh. That is sweet. So, the seeds are meeting our coffee beans to be. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And okay. so you probably don't want to swallow it them. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> but you can fiber. put a suck on them. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think I just chewed them. I just chewed them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it just tastes, it tastes green, like a, a sweet green, a sweet green fruit. There's nothing, there's certainly nothing coffee-like about it. You wouldn't recognize that as, as coffee. There you go. There's a little, a little berry. Good I'll throw my, before I get one stuck in my throat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, do you eat the, can you eat the outer flesh or no? Is it too? Um, I think you can. Um, I, uh, we actually have some drying out over there that we'll use to make coffee cherry tea. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you that a little bit too. Coffee cherry tea? Mm -hmm. You take those and dry them out in the sun and then basically steep them in hot water and you make, make a tea, tea out of it. And it tastes about what you're tasting right now, so it tastes like That'd be good. I've never yeah. heard of... I never knew never you could make that. tea. No. Yeah. My coffee beans make coffee, but the cherries can make tea. Technically, these skins make an herbal concoction because, David says, tea is a specific species of plant. 
we've already taken the seeds out of it to process this coffee. And then we take the, the pulps or the skins and dry them out in the sun right away. And all you do is put hot water on them and make tea out of it. But another guy told me that you should lightly roast them until you start to see these little bit, little um, dimples or blisters actually on the on the skin mm -hmm. and uh, for some reason he likes it better that way so we're still trying to figure it out we haven't perfected the technique just yet but throughout the centuries humans have perfected the coffee making technique you have the red cherries and uh, we have a machine that pulps those or takes the skin off of them and then you have a coffee seed like this that comes out, but it's got all the fruit material stuck to it called mucilage. And so we soak it in water for three days, and then the mucilage comes off until it's really clean, and then we dry it in the sun. After we dry it in the sun, then we have another machine that's a holer that holds the hard shell off of it. And then after the hard shell is gone, then we put it into another machine that grades it. It grades it according to the size and shape of the bean. And then after that, we sort it by hand. And after it's sorted by hand, then it's ready to be put into our burlap sacks or roasted. All for a cup of coffee. Yeah, all for a cup of coffee. Think about that on your next cup. As arduous as the process of actually making it is, it was perhaps more difficult for Saffron to get farmers on board from the beginning. They've been lied to before, where promoters would come in, which would might be Chinese businessmen, Lao businessmen, or even government officials that have said, here, plant this. When it comes to harvest, we'll give you this really good price. And, uh, and then when harvest comes around, then they don't give the good price or they never come back at all. And so they've been lied to before by outsiders and so there's a certain level of distrust. There's nothing we can say that'll change their minds about that. The only thing we can do is be consistent with what we say every time and then do better than what we promise and not less. And that's what we've tried to do over the years. And so that has taken time to build that kind of confidence and faith in us. The other big factor is just the poverty and the, the way that poverty kills an entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, to be an entrepreneur, you have to take a risk. And if you're really poor, you can't afford to take risks because if you plant something and it fails, then what are you going to eat? You know, you don't have any money, you don't have any food to eat. And so um, that has been hard because you plant rice or corn, you plant it this year, a few months later you harvest it and sell it. With coffee, it takes three years before you can get the first harvest. It's not an overnight thing. It's not a silver bullet that's going to change their lives immediately. But over time, it can definitely lift them out of poverty. It's almost time for me to lift myself out of here. But before I do, I've got one last box to check. Coffee beans get bigger when they're roasted. They also become less dense and lose up to 25% of their weight, but gain that heady aroma. You smell it? <laughs> it smells like heaven. If I could die right now, I'd be all right. And I have a cold, so only one nostril is working. But that's, that's so good. You can also eat one. Have you ever eaten a, a raw? A raw one? Uh, yeah, I have. Well, I've had chocolate-covered espresso beans, but this is this is the genuine article with nothing on it. Hmm. It's so good. I mean, we think of some uh, often coffee being so bitter, and it's probably kind of crappy coffee. Yeah, if it's bitter, because that's not bitter at all. It's just it's smooth. It's complex. That's really good. <laughs> So, I can just keep snacking on them. I'll be flying around here for the rest of the day. So if you're ever driving late at night and you're falling asleep, you know, you can just pop on those. You can. get the crunch effect and the full caffeine effect as well, because no filtering whatsoever. Yeah, so that's true. So great for late night driving. <laughs> Yippee! <laughs> in about 5% of coffee cherries, only one bean grows instead of the usual two. It's called a pea berry. It's smaller, rounder, and more dense, often with a distinct flavor. I bet if you eat one of these, you'll be able to tell the, the difference in flavor. Yeah, you can certainly see the difference in size. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Can you tell the difference? Mm -hmm. That to me, actually there's something in there kind of corn-like. Corn? To me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, maybe it's a corn nut. It's, there is, yeah, there is a... There is a very different flavor to me. It's uh, that to me is a little more, well, I guess, a little more nutty. Huh, interesting. Mm -hmm. As nutty as I am about coffee, 
I've got to get back to town or I won't sleep tonight. And I have a very early morning. It's about 5.45 in the morning and devout practicing Buddhists have already started lining the street in preparation for the Takbat. Before dawn, all over Southeast Asia, thousands of monks leave their wats, or temples, for this daily custom. Takbat is an age-old ritual in which observant lay people give daily alms of food to monastic members. These boys are novice monks. In the Theravada tradition, boys are initiated into Buddhism as young as seven years old. After that ceremony, many, especially those from poorer backgrounds, often stay in a monastery where they have access to an education. Many stay only through secondary school, but some remain monks for life. There are a few guidelines that uh, you need to keep in mind if you come watch the talk, but um, no more than you would run up and grab the Pope in, in a Christian procession, in a Catholic procession. Don't touch these people, don't touch the monks, don't follow them, don't interact with them, observe the rites in silence, uh, and try not to generally get in the way. Because it has become a bit of a tourist attraction and people do come out to watch, uh, it's become a little bit of a problem apparently, so just be respectful and you'll be fine. Flash photography is also discouraged. I haven't seen paparazzi like that since I left L.A. And yes, I am fully aware that I am part of the problem at the moment. There are some locals who try to sell packaged food to tourists so they can offer it to the monks. It's important to only take part in Takbat if it holds some spiritual meaning for you, and you'll want to offer fresh food that you've made. Sometimes your guest house or hotel can provide fresh sticky rice. The monks typically discard prepackaged food. It's usually donated to needy lay people. It's a beautiful religious practice, but one that I'll observe again from a distance without a camera. Now that our young monks have been provided for, it's time for me to find some breakfast. I have heard rumors that Le Banaton, a French bakery here, has the best croissants in the country. Not the town, the country. So I think I have to put that to the test. Look, this is my first stop in the country, so what the heck do I know? Thanks to that old French colonialism, Luang Prabang culinarily is the best of both hemispheres. The Laotian food is exquisite, but so are the baguettes and so are the croissants. I'm definitely going to stick with saffron for coffee, though. It's melts in your mouth. Life slows down in Luan Prabang. For me, coming from the U.S., the pace of life feels very similar to the Caribbean. Everything is on a much slower clock. For Southeast Asia, even the traffic is slow, and that is momentous. Such a peaceful little town. It makes you just want to stop and stay for weeks and actually unwind. The place is so surprisingly seductive that I highly recommend coming with flexible plans. And forget about bringing work along. The way of life here is so slow and the pace is so relaxing that I really don't care at this point if I film anymore or not. Much less get up before dawn so I can get all the filming done when the light is pretty and it's still cool. If I stop now though, it's going to be really good for me and really boring for you. Basically, the city center of Luan Prabang, the old French historic core, is designed for tourists. I mean, it really is a place to eat and drink and eat and drink and then eat and drink some more. One of the nicest things to do is sit by this gorgeous river and have a nice fruit shake or a cold beer. The problem is 
a lot of these decks that have been built by this river were built after the city got its World Heritage Site distinction, uh, and that makes those illegal. So some here fear that it's actually at risk of losing a UNESCO designation because the town, and rather than restore rather than preserving the heritage, is catering to those of us who like to eat and drink and eat and drink. So it may or may not have that UNESCO designation for very long. Chances are you'll still be able to come here and sit on a deck and, and enjoy a cold shake or a beer, though. Here's the thing about the designation. It's not easily lost. Before Luang Prabang could lose it, UNESCO would move it onto its list of in-danger sites. That hasn't happened. And there's legislation at all levels of government here to protect it in conjunction with UNESCO standards. But these changes do affect the integrity of the site, and that's a key element of maintaining the appellative. Since the town got the title of World Heritage Site in 1995, urbanization and sprawl have changed it quite a bit. And as with all heavily traveled places, people here are trying to strike a balance between the needed economic boost and preserving the reasons why travelers come here to begin with. The temples inside the protected center act as anchors to ensure that locals, local life, and culture persist here. Archaeologists believe this region of the Mekong River has been inhabited for at least 10,000 years. So I'm far from the first to travel through. And because I wanted to remain, it's important to me to stay here as sustainably and responsibly as I'm able. Especially because this place grabs a hold of you and tries to keep you. As far as traveling alone goes, there's no place I've been so far that's felt safer, and few places as relaxing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, this is how the show gets made. You just hand the cameras to strangers. <laughs> They do have the best time though. People go, wait a minute, you have camera people and you have this and that. I'm like, no, I don't. I have people that are willing to help. Yeah.